Cool. Thanks, everybody, for the patience there. Sorry about that. The, um, we, we, we tested this earlier, and it worked. Um, but we had a few technical difficulties, and we want to make sure that everyone can see the content that's, that's watching out there in internet land. Um, so who went to the AWS Summit um, in Sydney, what, a couple of months back now? Two months. OK, a few people. Did anyone come to the AC3 booth? Good on ya. You probably still worked for us then too. So if you didn't come, um, we had a couple of things that we, we, um, we set up. So usually we like to do a little bit of uh, um, you know, pushing the boundaries or a little bit of fun so that people can come and play with the stuff in our booth to show off what, what potentially uh, some of the things we can do. Um, and, and we, so what uh, Chris was talking about earlier, uh, Amplify, um, we're loving Amplify. We're building all sorts of things, internal apps, POCs for customers, and, and there's a couple of that we build here. Um, so if you, if you happen to be in Sydney next week, I'm at the, uh, the Sydney uh, user group next week um, talking about the, the quiz that I built. Uh, but tonight, we're going to talk about the, the other thing, which um, is, is a rock, paper, scissors um, app. All right, so um, let's kick off. So who are we? Uh, this is John. Say hi, John. Hi, John. <laughs> John, you want to tell okay, us yeah. a little bit about yourself? Um, so I, uh, I was a co-founder and CTO of Bulletproof, and I've come across to AC3, where I'm now head of product and technology, caring about all our technology and product-based things. And there's all my various handles. I'm John F. in most places. Cool. Uh, so I, um, I've been at Bulletproof not quite as long as John, about a third of the time, I suppose. Um, and yeah, so now moved across to AC3. I lead up um, all of our practice leads uh, over there now. Um, and you can find me, Gergen Z, pretty much everywhere. Okay, so what did we do? So we brainstormed this kind of in about January, February every year as to what we're going to do at the AWS Summit. Um, and this year we thought we might want to do something with Sumerium. Um, and we were trying to come up with some ideas about uh, maybe we could have a, 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 like a screen standing and you could interact with it some way. Um, and, and somebody, we were talking about it with some different people in the, in, the, in the org, and somebody actually said, why don't you play rock, paper, scissors with it, with the, with the host? And, and John, um, in his infinite wisdom... Very foolish, very foolish. ...decided to take up that challenge. Um, and then promptly decided to go uh, on leave and spend most of his leave uh, figuring out SageMaker, which he'll talk about in a minute. Um, so why did we do this? Um, fun, right? Like, why not? Um, learn some new technologies. We love to learn new technologies um, for the AWS Summit, as I already said. Uh, and, and ultimately, kind of, what can we do to showcase this and, and you know, look for opportunities to talk to customers about things, new customers and existing customers? All right, so I'm going to give a quick demo of the uh, running application that we built. And then what we're going to do is John's going to talk a little bit about um, SageMaker and the machine learning model. And then I'm going to jump in and I'm going to quickly build uh, using Amplify uh, a Sumerian scene that you can interact with very simply. So both of these are going to be very, very quick demos, but they're the basis of the building block. So we're not going to hand you the keys to build this whole app, but we've given you the building blocks. We're giving you the, the code so it's available. We'll, we've got the link at the end, uh, and you can go off and use those to start and build your own rock, paper, scissors bit of a challenge. Um, so let's have a look at this, and then I'll hand over to John. And that one. All right. So we don't have video. Let's see if we can get video. Yes, we can. Woohoo. Hi, my name is Chris. 
even. So you can see at the top, um, it's detecting in real time whether it's a Sorry, you can see at the top it's detecting in real time um, whether it's a rock, paper or scissor in the box. Um, then you sort of get the score at the bottom. How is she getting everything that I'm... <laughs> this was really annoying at AWS Summit. Like, people would play and they would always win and it's like, did you, did you yeah, make it so that you would won. always win? But no, it is purely random. I always, win. This could take all night. It always goes on forever when you don't want it to. <laughs> Let's see how we go. I guess I win. Yay! Woohoo! Uh, so there we go. So that's an example of the application. Um, I'll just hand. Oh, that was a live demo. <laughs> the, the secret to that working as a live demo is it's 100% in the browser. <laughs> yeah, the, the fun is yet to come. <laughs> um, so I'll hand over to John, who, who's going to take us through um, the SageMaker stuff. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, okay, what is machine learning? I'm not going to pretend to stand here and tell you that I understand anything about machine learning because I understand close to nothing about machine learning. Um, but I think the, the point of this talk that we wanted to get across is you don't have to understand the maths, the science, and how all this stuff works to actually be able to, to create a model that does something um, that's useful in real life. Um, basically, um, machine learning is about teaching machines to perform repetitive tasks. Um, this, um, this picture of a pigeon is actually pretty cool. Um, a bunch of scientists decided to teach some pigeons how to detect cancer. Um, so this pigeon is looking at a little sort of at a cancer cell um, and then it decides whether it's cancer in it or not. Um, a single pigeon can detect cancer with an 84% accuracy. Um, eight pigeons can detect cancer with a 98% accuracy, which is better than most radiologists. Um, and pigeons have tiny, tiny little brains. Um, so that's where, you know, so machine learning is great for that sort of repetitive thing um, where it's, it's something that humans can do very, very naturally, but it's very, very boring for us to do. Um, lots of maths. If you're still at uni, most people in the room probably aren't quite young enough to be. Um, go and do some maths. Like the key thing I discovered here is I wish I'd done the stats courses or remembered stuff from the stats courses. Um, machine learning is all about maths. There's all sorts of algorithms that you'll sort of remember and, and wish you'd done something with. So specifically on image recognition, um, there's a couple of um, standard image recognition models. Um, ResNet and MobileNet are two of the key ones. Um, ResNet's the model that I used initially because it's got native support in, um, in SageMaker. Uh, the problem with that was um, in the browser it takes about 200 milliseconds to do a, a detection with ResNet um, and the, the video just became really jerky. My hand was sort of doing this sort of business as you'd move it across the video. Uh, MobileNet's been written by Google. Um, as you can tell by the name, it's optimised for mobile devices. Um, it was sort of doing 70 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds um, conversion, so that worked quite well for us. Um, ImageNet is a, um, it's a corpus of images online that have been pre-labeled. So machine layer, to, to be able to create a machine learning algorithm, you've got to have a, a training set um, and a validation set. So you need data that's already been labeled, so you actually know what a, what a rock is, what a paper is, and what a scissor is, what they look like. Um, so ImageNet is what most people do to kick off machine learning models online. There's about a million images that have been pre-labeled. Um, so that's what most of the big guys are using to train their models. Um, what I've done in this particular instance, if you went and used ImageNet and did machine learning from scratch, that could take, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of, of, of instances, could take days, weeks. Um, it's very, very intensive and very expensive. Um, what we've done here is we've used a thing called transfer learning, where I've taken the mobile net model, you import the weights um, from that image net training that someone's already done for you, um, and then you sort of remove a couple of the layers from the machine learning neural net, and you just retrain on the top of that. Um, and we'll see a little bit later on, in literally four or five minutes, we can teach that particular model that could detect firemen and dogs and cats and birds to just differentiate between rock, paper, scissor, because it's already done, the hard work of how to sort of detect images has already been pretty much been done for you. So let's switch to my live demo. Okay, so um, I'm going to go into sort of this notebook piece first and then there's a section where it's going to do all the crunching and then I'll go back and talk about some of the AWS specific technologies. Um, so this is a Jupyter notebook. Um, it's an open source sort of tool. Um, it's one of the, the AWS tools that you can sort of run up inside of AWS. Um, actually, before I go there, I need to go back. No, where do we put it, Greg? 
there. there we um, go. So what I did here is, because I had to do this a lot of times, I wrote a, um, a script. Um, so this will be in the repository and it'll be useful to you. Oh, more. Great. <laughs> Actually, it's not important. You don't need to read it. Um, <laughs> it um, so the script's in the GitHub repository. Basically, what it does is it automatically sets up the Jupyter Notebook, uploads the notebook you've got sitting on disk into Jupyter. You can play with it there, and it'll download the model at the end and download the results. So I did this because I wanted to automate the process because I didn't want to lose anything. Um, the really important thing here is right at the end of the script um, on these lines, delete your notebook instance. These guys are expensive. There's, there's the free ones that are CPU only. They're sort of, you know, like a T2 micro sort of size. The P2 extra large, which I've used in this instance, um, they are two, $2.50 an hour. Um, don't be like John. Don't leave them on for a couple of days. It gets a little bit expensive. Um, OK, so um, creating machine learning models. So um, because I wanted to use mobile node, I had to do this manually. So this is sort of the manual process in a notebook of how to create that type of model. Um, so the first thing you need to do, as you, I described, you need that training set. That's what I was going to, th I thought would be the hardest thing. But fortunately, someone online had created a training set of 2,000 images for me. So it's at um, this Kaggle URL. So I've already downloaded all those images there. I couldn't put that in the script because you need a, a, a need a login to be able to download it. So I've grabbed all of that, um, and then I've just thrown it into an S3 bucket. Um, so this bit of code here is basically just downloading it. Um, from S3 onto the instance that's running of this Jupyter Notebook, and then we're just unzipping it. So these Jupyter Notebooks are pretty cool. You can see here Python is sort of the default that they, um, they execute, because Python's pretty, um, pretty much what most people use in this machine learning and data science sort of space for most of the tools. Um, if you put an exclamation mark in front of something, it will run it as a shell command. Actually, I should actually, the important bit, I should actually be running these things. OK, so that's going to sit there and do the unzipping. I'll keep explaining that while it's going away and doing its thing. So this is all running off in the cloud. This is just sort of the web interface to it. Um, you can put an exclamation mark in front of something, and it will, um, it will unzip it. So you can see there, there's the, um, the listing of what's on disk. If you put percent percent bash, that's basically a shell script. So you can see it's done a listing there. If you're so inclined, which I usually am, you can even run Ruby um, in there as well. And there are a bunch of other arcane language. Well, I say arcane. I was going to call it Perl arcane. Um, it sort of is. It's been a while since I've coded in Perl. Um, this one, let's see if it's gonna, what it's going to do here. That was needed. Sometimes this file exists and it mucks things up. I think it's more because um, AWS has got MXNet, which is their sort of machine learning engine. In this case, I've needed to use TensorFlow, so that's just a sort of a, took me a while to work that one out to make things work. So let's explore what the data looks like. So I'll run this piece of bash code. So basically, that zip file had a training and a validation directory. In, that, there's a, in the training directory, there's a C0, C1, and C2. So C0 is rock, C1 is paper, C2 is scissors. So in each of those directories, we've just got JPEGs of those different things. So this could be you know, cats versus dogs, could be hot dog versus no, not hot dog, um, whatever you want to throw in the directories. So we've got 2,300 odd training files and 103 validation files. So as part of the way machine learning works, you run the algorithm across a, uh, a, a training set, and then you run that across a validation set, which checks how well that actual algorithm worked. Um, and normally, you sort of do a, an 80-20 split. Not quite that in this case. Um, so next, we've got to set up some Python pieces. Where is my cursor gone? Down in here. OK, so that's just importing a bunch of Python libraries that we need to do, need to do some bits and pieces. Next, we've got a couple of parameters we need to set. So this, again, is sort of where there's the black magic. And this is the one thing I found as I was reading a bunch of tutorials and blog posts online on how to do this stuff. You'll find lots of examples. You, can't, you can almost do copy, you know, stack overflow programming and copy paste. That's what I did for the first two or three days. You really do need to slow down and actually start reading the blog post, reading the articles to get a bit of an understanding of what's going on. Batch size is a classic example. So the batch size is how many images get thrown into sort of each iteration um, of the machine learning model. Um, it's definitely memory constrained. So at 64 and 128, I'd run out of memory. So I had to reduce it. But none of these blog posts really tell you, you know, why 32 versus 31 versus 16. Um, there's a sort of a thing called hyperparameter tuning that I'll do later on. But basically, you just need to mess around with these values until you start getting the best results. Epoch is like a generation. Um, that's the total number of um, times that you process all of the images in your set. Um, for this particular um, model that we're building here, each generation takes about 30 to 40 seconds to run, um, which means that we can get a pretty good result uh, very quickly. 
Um, I was using 20 um, to make this demo run quickly enough. We're going to drop that down to, to 5. Um, and then the number of classes is just 3 in this case because we've only got rock, paper and scissors. So we'll run that piece. Um, so next we need to load the model. And I'll kick that off because that takes a little bit of time. Let's scroll back up. Um, so you can see here we're loading uh, the MobileNet V2 model. Um, the input shape um, is the effectively telling um, the model what you're going to input into it. So in this particular case, because it's image data, we're going to give it a 224 by 224 image with red, blue, and green, so three color channels. So we're actually throwing each pixel ends up being input to this neural net tree that gets calculated. We're also telling it that we're going to use the image net weights. So we're doing transfer loading, learning here. So you'll see here it's actually downloaded that um, from GitHub. Um, we're telling it not to include the top layer because we don't actually care about the, the, the actual image net model. We, we're recreating our own. We're setting trainable to true um, just in case it, was, it had been locked down to false. And then we print a summary. And this is where you'll see a very, very long list. This is the actual machine learning model. Um, it's, Lots and lots and lots and lots of lines um, with all these different types of algorithms, zero padding, deep wise, ReLU, which is some sort of um, statistical algorithm. Again, a bunch of things I don't pretend to understand. But it's not important. You can still work this stuff out. Um, OK, so next we need to prepare the new model, which I'll kick off as well. I'll run that and run again. Run. Um, so what we've done here is we've said, OK, we want a new model. Add in the model that we just loaded in before. Um, we're going to flatten it. We're going to make it dense. And we're going to use TANH as the algorithm for activation. We're going to have three classes. And we're going to use sigmoid as that activation. And then we're going to print out the summary. Again, no idea what these things do. But <laughs> they get you the result you need in the end. Um, go do maths at uni. Um, OK, so then you need to compile your model down. This one I do understand. So there's going to be some graphs that I'll show you later on. Um, the, the way these models work is they start training and they start to improve, but then they can sort of start to drop off and get worse and get better again. Um, this optimizer basically helps the model understand um, if it's falling off the end of the graph and getting worse and, and you know, whether it should backtrack or not. This loss algorithm is one that's good for categories and you know, we've got three categories versus maybe some sort of um, uh, semantic analysis or something similar and we want to care about the accuracy. Uh, so then we need to load in all the training data. Um, so what we're doing here is first here we're loading in the training set. Um, so just pointing at the paths on disk in these first couple of lines. But in these lines here, this is actually a, a, a pretty cool thing that we do. Um, so it's loading the images and then we're saying, okay, rotate them up to 40 degrees. Shift their width by 0.2, their height by 0.2, do some shearing, do some zooming. So what you end up here is A, adding a bit of randomization in here so it's not the same run every single time, and B, it's actually giving you a better data set because instead of just those standard 2,000 images, you know, you're rotating the image slightly and doing, a bunch, you know, doing some flips to make the, the, a, a, almost a bigger data set. And then we just load in the, the training um, data as is. Did I run that one? Yes, I did. Um, so the other thing that you can do with these models is you can set up, there's, there's, there's plugins that you can add. So I've added this checkpoint plugin. So what that allows it to do is every single time one of those epochs runs, so one generation of the algorithm, it's actually going to save the model off to disk. Um, why that's really important is sometimes you'll see you know, the model get 80%, 90%, 100%, and then it drops to 30 and then stays down there. So if you only saved it right at the end, the model that you'd actually download would be fairly useless and you could see, oh, look, along the way it was actually pretty decent. Um, there's some other plugins you can add. There's one called Early Stop, so where it actually sees that it's starting to degrade, will actually stop early rather than wasting your CPU time. Uh, so here we go. So this basically just calls the bit that says, hey, go do all the magic. So we're going to go and do all the magic. And in theory, here we go. OK, so it's running that first epoch. So while that's running, I'm going to switch across to my slides again. So what does AWS give us? Um, so, one of the f so there's a couple of things that fit into SageMaker. Um, the first one's ground truth. Um, so ground truth is all about that labeling. Now, I haven't used this um, at all, really. I've just done a bit of reading on it. But um, I think it's, there's a bit of an, an Amazon Mechanical Turk here where you can actually throw a bunch of images up, and then you can start getting them labeled. Um, the notebooks is the Jupyter Notebooks piece that we've just been looking at. 
Um, so the training is probably the most useful piece. So AWS has a bunch of built-in algorithms. So I'm going to go to, on, into those on the next slide um, for different sort of use cases. You can then create training jobs, say, okay, here's my data. So th what I've just shown you is the really difficult way of doing this. If ResNet was good enough because you didn't have my sort of performance constraints, you could basically say, I want a batch size of 32, I want an EPEC of this, my data's in this S3 bucket, about 50 lines of JSON, upload that into the training job API, AWS will machinate on it for a little while and throw the result into the S3 bucket of your choice. So that's the easy way. Hyperparameter tuning is what I sort of talked about in the parameters. That's where you can sort of say to AWS, here's the parameters that I think are about right, run this job over and over again, slightly changing the parameters until you can tell me what's the best parameters for this particular uh, machine learning job that I'm doing. Um, inference is the actual result of where you take your model, throw some data at it and get your result back. Is it a rock? Is it a paper? Um, you can host those in AWS and it'll do that all for you as an API. With our particular demo, because we knew the, the internet at the summit was probably going to be pretty, pretty bad, um, we used Tensor, uh, TensorJS, which allows you to run TensorFlow models in the browser. Um, and you can also do batch jobs where you upload your model and say, here's a million images, go wild and class classify them all for me. So the sort of algorithms you get, there's some natural language processing algorithms that come out of the box with, um, with SageMaker to do things like semantic analysis, um, image classification is the one we're playing with here. Um, IP insights, this one's actually pretty cool. You can say throw your, um, where people are logging into your website, all the addresses they're coming from. So you know, if Greg, for example, is normally logging in from Sydney, then suddenly, hey, he's logging in from Melbourne, that's pretty dodgy, why would he be down here? <laughs> you could block his access. Um, lots of other very mathy things that, you know, go and read the manual. Um, the other cool thing is you can bring your own. So this, um, that notebook that I've created, so you know, it's a bunch of Python code, you could actually wrap that up into a Docker image and deploy that um, and then have that SageMaker piece run that for you as well. Um, and hopefully in that break, oh, so close, so close. So you can see the first epoch run here, it took 65 seconds versus the second epoch's sort of 36 seconds. So you can see there's a little bit of setup time there. Um, on that first one, we've had a validation, an accuracy of 84%. Um, and then it's here, it's saved the model on that first run. We then had 88%, so that saved the model again. We then had 93%, so that saved the model again. And 93%, so that saved again. And it's finished now, which is great. So this is, so in, if, if I'd run that all up to 20, you'd act, we actually would have seen it drop off. Um, it starts to actually get a little bit worse. Um, and the final model that saves is not actually the best one. So let's see how we went. Um, and I haven't tested this with five, so these results might be interesting. Really cool thing about Jupyter Notebooks is if you're using Matplot, which is a pretty standard um, plotting library um, in Python, Matplotlib, you can actually run, um, a mat uh, run that again on that one, um, and it will actually, when it runs, come on, Oh, I ran that again. That was silly. <laughs> Here is one we prepared earlier. Can you press the plus key for me, Greg? My hand's not big enough. Yeah. Okay, so if you scroll down. Oops, here we go. So, yep, there's where we ran to sort of 20 epochs. Um, so the cool thing about Matplotlib is it will, and actually that's the great thing about these notebooks. So as I'm running this notebook and it's adding all the output, when you save that, it actually saves all the output, including the images. So there's the plot of our actual, um, of all our epochs. So there's the epoch numbers are on the bottom. So you can see that our training's gone up, you know, pretty nicely, but the actual validation has sort of jumped up and down a little bit. Um, this graph is sort of showing the loss in the training and how much, you know, what's the degree that it was getting worse um, or better. Um, so we can then sort of play around with our model. So here I've, um, what I've done here is I've grabbed all the validation data and loaded it in using Python. And then I've run that against the model. Um, and you can see here it's found, um, there was out of the 93 images, one of them had an error and then I've gotten it to display that, that image. So um, the original label was C2, uh, rock, paper, scissors. So I thought it was scissors, or well, it is a scissors, but it detected a C1, which was paper. Um, I've done the same thing to the training data. I've split this into two sections because there's 2,000 images and if lots of them are wrong, um, I didn't want to have to have lots of images come up. So again, one of those was wrong on this particular model that we pulled out um, and that was um, supposed to be a rock and it was a rock um, but only with a really low confidence level of 0.8. 
Um, so that's pretty much it. We're done there. So here, this is just saving the model and pushing it up into S3. Um, and then the really important bit again is go back to your script and shut down the instance, which I need to remember to do at the end of the night. Um, or it'll cost you a lot of money. Is this still running? Yeah, we'll come back to that later. Um, back to Greg, I think. Yep. Cool. Apologies. Thanks, John. I think the key takeaway there is staying kid, school kids. <laughs> All right, so now um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a look at uh, building uh, a very quick, uh, I'm going to go as fast as I can, um, uh, using Amplify um, and the Sumerian scene to kind of build a little quick interface that you can interact with. Um, very, very simple. Uh, and I promise I, I will go as, as fast as I, as I can. Um, so let me just get rid of that for a second. Um, so what we're going to do here is I'm just going to start off with one of the, um, the that's big enough. Yeah. yeah. Two more. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to use one of the existing templates and just kind of um, build on top of that. Um, so we'll just go with this one. Demo. Doesn't really matter what it's called. Uh, so this is going to create a new uh, empty scene for us, uh, with some kind of built-in things um, ready for us to 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 use. I'm not sure how it's going to show up with this this big, but hopefully we can work through that. If need be, I'll just go plus and minus here. So this is this is the scene that you get, uh, and and you've got all these objects uh, inside. So the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to click on um, Christine, and um, what we need to do is we're going to add um, a new component. We need to add a script, um, and we're going to add a custom script. <coughs> Uh, so we did that script there. So we're going to edit that. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, load in the, the host um, into our window so we can actually um, interact with it in JavaScript. This is a little bit of a, of, of a, of a hack um, and, and it may not really be the, the right way to do it. I'm going to also ex show you an example of using um, the built-in state machine of, of Sumerian and interacting with that. So there's a couple of um, different ways that we can we can do that. Uh, so let me just make sure I get this right. No dot host equals this. Okay, so let's save that. Uh, so the other things that I'm going to do um, on here, I just want to change the length of the gesture hold because 10 seconds. It's just when she does a, a gesture like waving or clapping, the hold is uh, 10 seconds by default. Uh, it's a little bit too long to keep the demo um, short. Uh, so what else do we need to do here? Okay, so we're going to create um, a new speech as well. So we'll just go into speech, create a new one. It gets a new one over here, so we'll give that one, we'll call it, say, hi. Um, that's not really that great. And then we're just going to um, put in here um, something like, so this is a kind of an XML type of interface. Uh, we'll just ask the question, is Melbourne or Sydney the best city? Um, oops. and save that. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the, the gesture speech that she does by default because it's kind of really big um, and, and just make that a little bit shorter. Uh, so maybe we'll just say um, we'll wave um, name equals uh, gesture colon wave And then what we'll do is we'll just break uh, for a short period of time there. So we'll do time equals 0.5 seconds. And then we'll say, hi, everyone in the AWS Melbourne user group. And just close that speak. All right, and save that. 
All right, so we've done that, we've done that. All right, now we need to um, publish this. And for interacting with the Amplify, we, we, can, we don't have to publish this um, publicly. We can publish it privately. Um, there is a little hack that I'm going to use to do with uh, not authenticating. I wouldn't suggest doing that in the, in the real world. Um, now, I'm going to try republishing it right away, but I've had some issues with initially it loading, but we'll see, we'll see how we go if we, if we run into an issue later on. All right, so um, what we're going to do is we're just going to create a, a new, um, new React app. Uh, Sumerian. So hopefully that loads really quickly with the super fast internet here, which is heaps faster than the one at home. <coughs> That's pretty quick. So this is just creating the boilerplate for a React app um, so that we can build it. And then in, inside of there, we're going to add in the um, AWS Amplify uh, framework. And then we'll start building our little app really quickly and using Sumerian. <clears throat> do, do, do. All right, done. Amplify in it, so we just set up a new app. That's pretty cool. That's fine. Uh, I'm a Vim guy. JavaScript, React, source, build. That's fine. That's fine. Yes, I'd like to use one of those. That's the only one in there at the moment, which is great. Um, and the key here is, right, so um, if you remember back to um, Matt's talk uh, a couple of months back, um, he probably took you through this. This is going to create a bunch of things in, inside of um, AWS that, you, that are going to be the, the basis of our um, Amplify um, uh, application that we're building. So that's, that's going to take a, a couple of seconds. So while that, that does that, I'll just quickly talk about some of the other interesting things inside of the, the console, um, the scene editor, I should say. So you can add, you can change the background. You can also change the, the host to be a different person. You can change the voice. So you can see here there's, there's Amy. So I'm going to stick with Amy for now. Um, the other interesting thing um, is the state machine. And this is where you can uh, start to actually build inside of the Sumerian, uh, why? You can build inside the, the Sumerian uh, scene that some of the things that you might want to do with your host. Um, so in this example, on start, um, she's going to, to talk and do the gesture run through, which I, I showed earlier. And then on the key presses of A, B, C, and D, she'll, she'll do different things. Um, so that cloud formation is probably done now. So the key here to be able to actually interact from um, your React app with Sumerian is adding auth. And this is where I'm going to do a little bit of a dirty hack um, to, to kind of just bypass all of that. So we've added the authentication, which is using Cognito. And, and I'm just going to push that, which goes and creates um, a Cognito uh, identity pool uh, and some roles. So it's a little bit of a lie. It doesn't take um, that long. It says a few minutes. It's, it's about 90 odd seconds. Um, but we do have to we do have to come in here um, and, and kind of hack in a few little things. Uh, so I think that's is that today's role? Yeah, I hope so. <clears throat> Twenty six nineteen forty one. Yep, that looks like it. All right. So um, uh, I've got some I've got some JSON that I've pre prepared. Uh, so let me just grab that. Um, I'm going to improve. Uh, Sumerian Summit. And where is it? <clears throat> so I'll just steal that and paste that in here. So, yes, um, I'm kind of allowing all the access. Don't do this, it is bad. Uh, demo, 
that's fine. And hopefully now in that amount of time, we've got our Cognito user pool, maybe not quite. Oh, sorry, identity pool, I should say. Uh, nope. This is where I have to, I don't know, tell a funny joke. Anyone know any good dad jokes? Um, so maybe back um, a little bit of other things that we can go in here. So you, there's the, the ground material. Um, the, the background, the sky. You can, you can also have a camera, and, and what we actually did, um, and, and maybe if you're interested, we can talk about this later, is, is to get her to turn and look at you. We, we created a point and had her look at that point in, in side space, um, which was, a, again, a little bit of a, of a hack to move her around. Um, and in that time, we should hopefully have the identity pool done. No, not quite. How? <laughs> there we done. There we go. We're done. All right. So we just have to go in here and do another naughty little thing. And then we'll be able to run it up and, and see our quick little demo running. OK, so save changes. All right, cool. So that's done. So what we need to do, I'm just going to do this again because I don't trust it. Download my JSON config and, and copy that into, into our app. So just go move, uh, downloads, Sumerian into source. Sumerian underscore exports dot JSON. Let's just make sure I got that right. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. Um, and then the other thing I need to do is just copy in our actual application. Um, we'll approve Sumerian Summit and Sumerian app dot JS source app. JS. Okay, so let me just take you quickly through that. Um, so, usual sort of stuff at the top, we're importing a bunch of libraries, Amplify, uh, XR, the X AWS exports from, from Amplify. So, if you've done an Amplify project, some of these will look pretty familiar. Um, and the important ones here is the scene config um, and, and Sumerian scene from, from Amplify React. Sorry? Okay. Um, then we're kind of, we've, we, we need a new poly so that she can um, talk. Uh, then we've got, um, we're just setting up our, our scene here. So then what we're going to do, we've got two things that we're going to get it to do. So we're going to get it to say something and do something with some buttons. And then I'll also show you um, the Amplify component, so using ABCD to actually get it to do things as well. So we're just setting up a couple of functions here to get it to do those things. Um, and you can see here, the window.host, this is where we're, we're hooking into that um, object that we exported um, in the script earlier. We also, to get it to um, do some um, emotions, we, we have to jump into the system bus and we can hook into that with uh, window.sumerian. Then we just, just, just do the render, right? So if anyone's familiar with a, a React app. Um, <clears throat> all right, now let's run this. Um, and uh, see what happens. Um, dun, 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 the moment of truth. Just wait for all of that 10 gig of JavaScript to download, um, as any good modern application should include at least 10 gigs of JavaScript. And yes! <sighs> Sumerian host. Hi, everyone in the AWS Melbourne user group. Yeah. Mm. OK, so um, we can get her to clap. So now you can see that we're using the JavaScript to interact with her, uh, and we can Is get her. Yeah, and we can get her to say stuff. So that's using the JavaScript to get um, our host to do things. Um, using the, the state machine, we can also do something like A, 
so we can get it to do applause. Um, B, what was B? Board. Oh, yeah, okay, so I'm not sure. Is that board, is it? <laughs> um, and C, I think, is cheering. Yep, and then D gets her to do the gesture thing um, again, so do the introduction again, but I'm not going to do that. So that's creating the Sumerian scene. So, so now you've got the building blocks to, to, to put it all together um, and, and, and to, to build the, the app that we showed at the beginning of... of um, whew, it went into presenter mode this time. Okay. Anyway, that's it from me, so just to finish off, I'll hand over to, to John to, so, to yeah. give us a quick rundown and, and then we're done. Thanks, Craig. Um, so yeah, look, actually, let me, that's not very big on that screen. I'll read it off here. Um, so yeah, look, just a couple of takeaways. Um, so the first one is, look, it's really not that hard. Um, I think the, the piece that Greg did um, in the Sumerian editor, if you've ever played with Unity, it's very, very similar. Um, it's pretty much based on the same sort of stuff. Um, the bits that I did looked really complicated, right? I was looking, running through all this Python code and talking about epochs and batch sizes. If you use the built-in um, Amazon SageMaker models, it's really easy. You just point it at some images in an S3 bucket, give it some parameters, it goes away and does stuff. Um, so, you know, AWS is really abstracting a lot of the pain away and making this stuff easier. Um, it's also pretty cheap. Um, so, you know, as long as you're not like John and don't leave your P2 extra large instance running for a couple of days, um, it is, you know, a couple of bucks an hour. Um, to run a simple sort of model. Um, and as you saw, we created a model that had, I think, two errors. Um, the one that I ran for 20 iterations uh, took um, about 10, 15 minutes, and the one that we just ran live was about five minutes. And actually, we'll switch back later and see where that got to and how accurate that one was. Um, and uh, look, the last thing I think is, um, look, go back, have a look at these bits of technology, um, and just you know, have a think about what can you do um, either at work or personally that you know, maybe you could throw a bit of machine learning at it, whether it's sentiment analysis, um, or maybe it's you know, hot dog, not hot dog, you know, the classic one, um, or you know, is it is it throwing the output of some uh, model? I know that we had a customer um, that was in sort of the, the charity space, and I always sort of wondered, you know, if, if we took all the historical data for the last ten years from when people signed up, all that sort of classic demographic data that you collect. And then, you know, threw that into a machine learning model. At the moment that someone signs up, could you predict, you know, how much they're going to donate, and almost, you know, do your revenue prediction at the start of your campaign? Um, and if you've got any questions, let's uh, let's discuss them. Uh, yeah, and that that URL, um, and we'll we'll post that on Twitter later on. Um, you can find um, all the code that we've talked about today. Cool. Thank you. So, we, have we got a minute for questions? Cool. Uh, have you tried any other hand gestures at the AI itself, for example, giving it the bird or any sort of sign language at it to see if it recognises it as either a rock, paper or scissors? Yeah, so the algorithm as it is for some reason tends to default to rock. I don't know if that's because it's like the first class. Um, but yeah, so it'll, it'll always do some sort of detection. So if we throw it back up again later, you'll see those probabilities along the top. You just get a really low probability on sort of all three of them. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Do you want a book or a or cloud? Or neither? You can have neither if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Come and grab it. Any, Any questions? more questions? Yep. Yes. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Thank you. Uh, what's the most important lesson you've learned through trying to train uh, these kind of models? Um, Sorry, I'll, 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 that's a huge scope. I'll yeah. narrow it down. <laughs> when you're taking the photos, yeah. uh, what's, what's the important things that you need to know? So fortunately, we didn't have to because someone had done the, the model. But I think, I think it's the more variety, the better, right? You know, different angles, different lighting. The more data you can throw at it, the better answers you're going to get. The key learning is, as I've said a couple of times, disclaimer, don't leave it running. <laughs> <laughs> Come and grab something afterwards. Any more questions? Come on, there's swag involved. Ask anything. Anything. <laughs> Do you want a job? <laughs> Segway. Segway. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Cool. Thank you.